Tonight's presentation is titled, The Untold Story. How the farmers of Henry County, Kentucky, contributed to a tobacco program that preserved an agrarian way of life. The story of tobacco is a story that goes well beyond the founding of America four centuries ago. It is a people story and a Kentucky story. And so we are hosted tonight here at the Berry Center in Newcastle, the county seat of Henry County, and the Henry County Historical Society of Kentucky, the state which, from the Civil War until the end of World War I, raised more tobacco than any other state in the nation. Tobacco people have made tonight's story possible. From the P.T. Berry family, to Earl Hammer Smith, to John Inscore Essek, to Mike Grimes for his photographs, to reference librarians at the University of Kentucky and Frankfurt's Tom Clark Library, to Jean Foury of the Henry County Public Library who opened the Henry County local files to me, and to Kathy Sanford at the Lexington Burley Tobacco Growers Cooperative Association. Their efforts have given me the voice for tonight's story. And I also want to thank my wife, Janet, who is a wonderful editor and a great coach. With my wife, Sandra, and six-week-old son, Jesse, I moved to a 135-acre farm off of Highway 22, just outside of Pleasureville, in 1972. We raised a large flock of sheep, a small cow-calf herd, the hay and corn and grass to feed them, and 12,000 pounds of tobacco. We were neighbors to Rose and Russell Herod, to Howard Lee and Janice Byers, to Tommy Meeks, to J.C. and Zeta Dowden. And at our farmhouse, we replaced Lewis and Sarah Shaw, the man who taught me to raise tobacco. They were tenants to Mrs. Sadie Kofer, from whom we bought the farm. Through his son, Wendell, I came to know John Marshall Berry, a Newcastle lawyer who was president of the Burley Tobacco Growers Cooperative. I often visited with Mr. Berry in his law office in the 1970s and discussed with him challenges facing the tobacco program and his responsibilities as president of the co-op. We sold our farm in 1980 and I started a new life which took me away from Henry County until my purchase in 1998 of a small tobacco farm between the Point Pleasant Church and Franklinton. I since reconnected with old Henry County friends and have made many new ones. In collaboration with the Berry Center, I volunteered to annotate John Berry's tobacco files left in his law office at the time of his death in 1991. For the last eight years, I have researched Kentucky's agricultural history and the role of tobacco cultivation in Henry County. Tonight's program is devoted to the story of how the people in one county and one state contributed to a national agricultural program of production control and price supports that preserved the small family farms whose people grew the crop. Their work started in 1920 when they organized into the world's largest agricultural cooperative, the Burley Tobacco Growers Cooperative Association. The co-op became an integral part of America's New Deal, and it ensured economic prosperity for small farmers whose hard work in growing agriculture's most labor-intensive crop fostered an agrarian culture without peer in this century. The tobacco program combined county, state, and federal programs that preserved small farms 
and generated tax revenues that always exceeded the profits of the farmers that raised them. Undone by the health risks of smoking, tobacco cultivation and the agrarian, cult the agrarian culture it supported have been transformed. Tobacco cultivation as a way of life has slowly ended. Tobacco barns are collapsing. Plastic on greenhouses that house the floating plant beds are blowing away. Hand-tied auction sales that have been replaced by 600-pound bales of tobacco sold by contract. And the tobacco men of the Burley Belt have been replaced by temporary workers who cut, house, and strip tobacco. Still, no history of Kentucky, its people, and its rural heritage would be complete without an examination and an understanding of the impact of tobacco on the state and its people. Colonial settlers found indigenous natives along the James and Rappahannock rivers to be using tobacco for celebratory and healing purposes when they arrived. Cultivation of the crop in Virginia and Maryland rendered it a lucrative export to Great Britain. After the Revolutionary War, explorers from the Chesapeake moved westward to Kentucky. Kentucky became a state in 1792, and Henry County was formed in 1798 from the old boundaries of Shelby County. Down the Ohio, Tennessee, and Cumberland rivers, and through the Cumberland Gap, settlers came in search of new land to pursue the farmer's life. Their ancestors were former indentured servants, modest in accomplishment and ambition. They did not own slaves. These settlers were familiar with tobacco's cultivation and were escaping depleted soils in search of fertile ground. They sought to use family and exchange labor to raise the crop of tobacco. The soils and the topography of Kentucky were as distinctive as the tobacco they raised. The common factor among Kentucky's tobacco growers was that tobacco cultivation was and remains to this day the most labor intensive crop, agricultural crop in the world. The labor intensity of tobacco's cultivation and its value to the farmer created an agrarian culture centered around community and family. Tobacco farming was a family enterprise and a way of life that defined rural Kentucky for more than a century. The Civil War destroyed most of the farms in the states of the Confederacy. Thus, Kentucky emerged as the largest producer of tobacco between 1870 in 1924. Kentucky soils and climate enabled farmers to grow burley on the limestone soils of north central Kentucky and dark tobacco on the plains of western Kentucky. Burley and dark were used for different products. Over time, the growth of cigarette consumption and its reliance on burley and the decline of chew and snuff, which relied on dark tobacco, cemented Kentucky's tobacco farmers as indispensable to the tobacco industry. One of those farms along the road from Newcastle to Port Royal belonged to Prior Thomas Berry, born in 1864, the year that White Burley was discovered in Ohio. P.T who was known to his family and friends as Din, was married to Maddie. They were parents of two sons, Wendell and John. And as did most farmers during this time, Din suffered through the years of the tobacco trust monopoly started by James Buchanan Buck Duke in 1890. In 1900, the year of John Barry's birth, just over 5% of American farms raised tobacco. But in Kentucky, 36% of the 
of those farms raise tobacco on more than 86,000 farms. Kentucky farmers were unhappy with the trust domination of the marketplace. Though farmers' concerns varied by crop, rural America at the outset of the 20th century was beset by new farming organizations that took stands against the consolidation of labor, capital, and railroads. This was true in Texas for cotton farmers, in the Northwest for wheat farmers, and wherever tobacco was grown. Here in Henry County, Henry Swain, the son of a physician from Smithfield, came under the influence of James Everett, a non-farmer from Indianapolis who founded the American Society of Equity. Swain held meetings all across the Burley Belt, holding a farm mortgage in one hand. He organized equity unions in eight counties. Bright Tobacco Growers established a cooperative association in Virginia, while in Kentucky's dark tobacco region, the growers established the Planters Protective Association in 1904. Coordination and achieving consensus on pooling prices and production control made this work difficult. As farmer discontent grew and spread, disagreements evolved into night riding violence, property destruction, warehouse burnings, and farmer outmigration from Kentucky. Night riding spread from the Black Patch to the Burley Belt. Plant beds were scraped in Campbellsburg and Defoe. Warehouses and barns were burned in Owen County and houses were burned to the ground in Shelby County. A Civilian Law and Order League was organized by Judge Ben Hill in Henry County. And for years, for days, the state militia resided in Newcastle's hotel. A childhood experience for John Barry would influence his life's ambition and dedication. Recorded at the age of 87, John Barry recounted his father's travel by horseback to Worthville to catch a train to Louisville for the sale of his 1906 crop at the Hogshead Market. Wendell John and their parents had talked anxiously about the sale, but Den Barry returned from Louisville that night a disappointed man. Given the warehouse fees, way bills, transportation costs, the cash receipts of the sale of his tobacco were less than this cost of production. Barry's account of his father's disappointing sale and his personal vow to help the farmer would set for him a life goal. In 1911, the federal government convicted Duke's Tobacco Trust for violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act and took steps to break up the monopoly. From 1910 until 1920, America experienced high commodity prices and relative well-being. But in 1920, crop prices declined precipitously. The Henry County local editorialized for a courthouse meeting made up of farmers without regard to class or rank or condition, men who in the shadow of a great menace are depressed, discouraged, and darkened in their souls. When the 1920 crop market opened, tobacco prices were one half of 1919's closing price and sales were halted by farmers. John Berry, now a student at Georgetown College, was working in his father's stripping room and he must have been reminded of his father's disappointing sale years earlier. Robert Worth Bingham bought the Louisville Courier Journal and the Louisville Times in 1918. Judge Bingham grasped the importance of tobacco to Kentucky's economy and summoned his colleagues and clients and friends to New York City to meet with the financial expert Bernard Baruch. Baruch introduced the committee to the work 
of Aaron Sapiro. Aaron Sapiro was a Jewish charismatic California lawyer who was organizing farm cooperatives for nut, citrus, and grape growers in California. In March of 1921, at the Sealback Hotel, Sapiro addressed the meeting of Kentucky businessmen, bankers, and farmers, convened by Judge Bingham. He explained cooperative marketing, his ironclad contract, commodity grading, and pooling at preset prices. At the conclusion of Sapiro's speech, Judge Bingham stood up and offered a resolution to establish a Burley Tobacco Marketing Cooperative with state and county committees. The Henry County Committee was chaired by H. Kirby Bourne, the county's largest tobacco grower and owner of Kevin Flood's farm across the road from the P.T. Berry farm. These county committees held courthouse meetings where copies of Sapiro's speech were circulated. The first local contract sign-up was held on June the 4th at Carrollton. The meeting featured a brass band, a parade of farmers, a burgoo picnic, and 235 farmers who pledged 1.4 million pounds of their 1921 crop to the cooperative. Sapiro's ironclad contract stipulated a mandatory performance of for five years and would be viable only if 75% of the previous year's crop was pledged. Just before the organizing drive ended, Sapiro spoke to a crowd of 2,000 people at the Henry County Courthouse. He declared the contract what he called Kentucky's Declaration of Independence, which would lead to improved roads, better schools, and strong churches. In November of that year, Sapiro announced that 84% of the 1921 crop was under contract by 55,000 tobacco farmers. Henry County is small in size, but its crossroad villages in rolling terrain set up a rivalry among tobacco men. Where do you sell your tobacco? Carrollton or Shelbyville? Who raised the most pounds per acre? Cropper, Pleasureville, or Eminence? And what was their average price per pound? Henry County farmers pledged 91% of their 1920 crop to the co-op had the most signed contracts of any county in Kentucky with over 2,000, and they ranked fifth behind Fayette, Bourbon, Mason, and Shelby counties in pounds under contract. The Henry County local called Judge Bingham the quote, greatest benefactor to tobacco growers in all of history. In June of 1922, John Berry graduated from Georgetown College and returned to his farm as a laborer. Co-op membership had increased to over 80,000. John attended organizing picnics to recruit members, make speeches, and solicit contracts. After addressing 1,000 people at Turner Station, the Henry County local called him, quote, Henry County's own son who believes and lives in cooperation. In 1923, the co-op established a Department of Community Involvement and hired a female Red Cross social worker to organize farm families to spread the gospel of cooperation. Her name was Verna Elsinger, and she organized auxiliaries in every crossroad community in Henry County. They often held frequent meetings in which mothers would read poems that they had written and the children would sing songs about the value of community cooperation. She staged a community pageant on the history of tobacco and the importance of cooperation in improving rural homes, schools, and churches. The pageant, with a, with a cast of over 300, was held on David McGuire's farm on the Campbellsburg Road 
and was attended by 12,000 picnickers who listened to the music of the Vive Indiana Brass Band and viewed the pageant with the role of Sir Walter Raleigh played by John Marshall Berry. Days before the pageant, Congressman Campbell Cantrell, a Scott County tobacco grower, died and was replaced by Watkins Morris from Newcastle to serve in the remainder of his term. In the campaign to replace Morris in 1924, a rally was held in Port Royal for Virgil Chapman, a lawyer from Bourbon County and the former assistant co-op counsel for the co-op. Barry arrived late at the rally, but was implored by friends because of his speaking elegance to speak on behalf of the co-op and its ambitions. Days later after the speech, Barry received a letter from Mr. Chapman asking him to campaign on his behalf and offering barrier employment as his congressional secretary. Barry agreed with the stipulation that he be allowed to attend law school while employed. Chapman won his election easily. Barry accompanied him to Washington, attending the George Washington University Law School, graduating in 1927. Importantly, while Barry was employed in Washington and going to law school, he was able to learn about the intricacies of congressional life. Barry returned to Newcastle as the co-op's five-year contract was ending. Its board did not renew another contract or undertake a membership drive, despite John Barry's belief that it would generate new members and increase prices. Years later, John described his initial years as a lawyer in Newcastle as a, quote, half-hungry, rabbit-eating, briar-jumping country lawyer. But during those years, Barry made good use by courting his wife, Virginia, from the Perry family in Port Royal. He became a bank board member, a Georgetown College trustee, a stalwart in the Kentucky Democratic Party, and a Sunday school teacher at the Hopewell Baptist Church. To friends, he was known as Mr. Johnny. In 1932, FDR was elected president and Congress passed the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which signaled the New Deal's intention to adjust commodities through production controls in return for price supports. The legislation shaped six agricultural commodities and tobacco was the only commodity which was neither food nor fiber. Just before Christmas in 1940, John Willie Jones, the co-op president, and Frank Taylor, the co-op's executive secretary, traveled to Newcastle to offer Mr. Johnny appointment as the director for the co-op for Henry and Trimble counties. Sworn in during the spring of 1941, Barry was elected first vice president, revised its corporate charter, and at the request of the United States Department of Agriculture, created a Commodity Growers Association to grow and stockpile hemp seed because of an anticipated rope shortage during World War II. Twice during the war, tobacco state congressmen approved tobacco programs, even though the legislation's statutory provisions for disappearance were not met. Congress raised all minimum burly tobacco allotments to one acre and exempted them from future reductions. After the war, as yields increased over 500 pounds per acre, John Berry created the Dark and Burley Tobacco Export Association to create an export market and Congress made tobacco part of the Food for Peace program. When Republicans captured the presidency in 1952, tobacco leaders were warned that the USDA Secretary Ezra Taft Benson was critical of the tobacco program. 
John Berry formed the eight state Burley Tobacco Committee in 1955 to assess and correct the program's faults. Benson's criticisms of the tobacco program were based on the failure of county production control committees in Eastern Kentucky, mismanagement between state committees, hidden fields, and loss of Kentucky's Burley allotments to other states. The committee's recommendations were implemented by federal legislation that included a 25% reduction in quota, important regulatory changes, and mandatory field measurements. Near the end of his life, John Berry told his, his oral history, history questioner about the necessities of studying your lessons. Barry was a student of the tobacco program long before it became so complicated. He knew the legal history, understood the principles behind production control and price supports, and knew personally of the toil behind the crop's cultivation. In the 1950s, after reports in the Journal of American Medical Association and follow-up stories in Time and U.S. News and World Report, he was not surprised by the 1964 Surgeon General's report, nor the outrage of congressional critics against the program. Though scientific data on nicotine's addiction was many years off, Berry defended tobacco against restrictions on labeling and advertising arguing that the studies relied on statistics without proving causation. He opposed tobacco tax increases and highlighted the enormous revenues generated for state and federal governments. In the top drawer of his office desk was an unopened pack of cigarettes, which he often showed to visitors as proof that he was not a user. In the winter of 1953, when British researchers published studies showing the link between tobacco and cancer, tobacco industry leaders were called together to consider a strategic response. Their work resulted in the publication of what came to be known as a frank statement. It planted seeds of doubt and denial by an industry under criticism. The Frank Statement was published in over 400 newspapers, carried the signatures of industry leaders and the presidents of all three tobacco grower associations. The second meeting of that industry group at the Plaza Hotel in New York was attended by John Berry on behalf of Win John Willie Jones. Berry was a unifying leader who maintained his integrity and credibility within the industry by acknowledging the commodity's vulnerabilities without jeopardizing the hard work of its farmers. Opinionated and stubborn, he did not betray his kinsmen or his home place, and his ideas brought the industry together. The tobacco program, nearly 25 years old, and involving the livelihood of thousands of farm families was complicated. The early pioneers of the cooperative's founding and veterans of the Black Patch Wars were long deceased. Congressional leaders, industry spokesmen, and government bureaucrats in Washington, Frankfurt, and Newcastle changed continuously. Here stood John Berry, with the training and political experience to guide the program's diverse interests, when Surgeon General Luther Terry jolted the industry with the publication in 1964 of his report on tobacco and health. Released on a Saturday so as not to affect the stock market, the report linked smoking to bronchitis, emphysema, and heart disease. It estimated a tenfold increase of smokers with lung cancer, a 70% increase in mortality rates, but hedged on the question of nicotine addiction. 
Within weeks, the House Committee on Agriculture held hearings to establish a federal research laboratory, and John Berry was asked to testify. His rem remarks were scholarly and full of compassion for the report's implications for his home place. He said, all of us have been agitated and concerned for the past decade over the charge that there is a causal relationship between the use of tobacco and health. We have been hopeful that this charge would pass, but now tobacco stands charged in the public mind by this report. Barry knew of still more complications yet unknown to Congress nor to Henry County farmers. The program was not controlling production. Excess stocks were accumulating at the co-op. Taxpayer liabilities were growing, and divisions arose between flu-cured and burly growers. And the Surgeon General's report worsened all of these problems. After years of public meetings and the formation of the Council on Burley Tobacco, Senator John Sherman Cooper introduced legislation in 1970 to treat allotment holders equally if quotas were cut, allowed for leasing of burley allotments, and converted production control to poundage. John Berry testified on behalf of the Cooper bill, arguing that price support program depended on production control, which he said we do not have. He went on to add, of the 31 crops since 1940, only four produce crops smaller than the quotas proclaimed. He added, we are confronted here with a critical problem. Acreage allotments do not control. We have to do something better. I wish we could do everything for your congressman's growers, everything that you want done for your small grower, and indeed for Kentucky. All of Kentucky is small growers. But to do as you insist means that we will lose what we have, which is price protection and bargaining power in the marketplace. He continued, I am speaking for an organization that makes no distinction between growers. But if we do not remedy this now, 34% of the so-called big ones will vote it out in the referendum rather than to take a 30% cut. This was not a threat, but was meant to serve as a public warning of farmer sentiment. The Cooper bill soon passed and was approved by 96% of the growers in the Burley Belt, and it passed in Henry County, 3,567 to 13. While poundage control brought supply and demand back into balance, Tobacco's problems were far from over. Imports of burly tobacco were increasing. Exports were decreasing. And public concern rose over taxpayer support of tobacco. In the summer of 1975, the House Committee on Agriculture held field hearings across the tobacco belt to gather information on issues affecting tobacco production. John Berry warned the House Committee of Senate opposition to the tobacco program and joined other spokesmen in urging unanimity in legislative changes. Now 74 years old and facing the growing influence of other trade associations like the Kentucky Farm Bureau, John Berry resigned as co-op president in 1975 but continued as legal counsel and board member. Barry represented the United States at the World Tobacco Leaf Symposium in Geneva. He returned concern deeply about third world tobacco production, and he told his fellow directors, we are gradually going to be replaced until we'll be providing only the salt and pepper for the American cigarette. In the waning years of the Carter administration, between 1976 to 1980, two trends began to affect tobacco industry. The first were changes in cultivation between flu-cured and burly growers as 
flu cured growers went to mechanization and bulk barns. The second change was a growing public awareness of health risks associated with tobacco. The first caused divisions between the grower programs and the second jeopardized taxpayer support for the tobacco program and tobacco farmers. Joseph Califano, Carter's secretary of HEW, launched his anti-smoking campaign in 1978, which brought about eventual passage of the No Net Cost Tobacco Program in 1982. The No Net Cost Program levied charges against tobacco growers to defray taxpayer costs. The legislation was aimed at tobacco cooperatives and it was based on the mistaken belief that tobacco farmers receive subsidies for growing tobacco. The program's vulnerabilities were fast multiplying. Burley's disappearance was in decline. Worldwide production of Burley was growing. And imports of Burley had increased from 5 million pounds in 1970 to over 150 million pounds in 1984. Assessment fees for the no net cost program had grown from one cent per pound to 30 cents per pound with future estimates exceeding 55 cents on the crop unless transforming legislation was passed. Transforming legislation was introduced as the Tobacco Program Improvement Act of 1985 with nine Republican co-sponsors including Mitch McConnell. It was signed into law by President Reagan in April of 1986. McConnell praised the tobacco industry's unity, which he said had reduced price supports, shared a, a, a split on no net cost fees with the buyers, had encouraged manufacturers buyout of stocks and their participation in future quota determinations. In October of 1987, John Barry Jr. was elected president of the co-op. The younger Barry faced a host of problems and much uncertainty about what growers wanted in their program. In December of 1988, John Barry Jr., known at home as Little Johnny, gave a speech to the Kentucky Farm Bureau Tobacco Conference titled, When We Awake, Will, this, will There Still Be a Tobacco Program? He praised the State Farm Bureau and said grower organizations needed to work together. He asked of his audiences, what are our differences? Do they really exist and can they be resolved? Barry then launched a critique of the Transformed Tobacco Improvement Act of 1986, cited the profits of American agribusiness, and claimed that the only farm organization formulating agricultural policy was the American Farm Bureau. He concluded to his audience that by your acquiescence with Farm Bureau policy, you are in bed with your enemy. And he picked up an American Farm Bureau policy booklet and said, the tobacco program provides for quotas and the Farm Bureau policy calls for their elimination. The tobacco program provides for price supports and Farm Bureau policy calls for their reduction. The tobacco program is designed to preserve the farm population and Farm Bureau policy is to remove millions from the rural economy. The tobacco program has managed a program of supply management and price support for 50 years, and Farm Bureau policy calls for its demise. Barry concluded that the devastation of rural America is neither an accident nor the result of changing times or technological development. Rather, he said, it is a crisis by design. And he asked, Will you join the ranks of those advocating a policy to preserve the tobacco program and family farming, or will you join the ranks of those who have been driven from the land? Not unlike his father, little Johnny tried to unify farmers of the Burley Belt 
against the corn and soybean farmers of American agribusiness. Their younger Barry's challenge to the Farm Bureau was duplicated six months later in his speech to the Burley Auction Warehouse Association Convention in Nashville. John spoke of his family's home and farm, built by his great-grandfather, John Johnson Berry, and of his mother's family, the Perrys, from Port Royal. More than five generations of the Berry family had raised tobacco on the same farms, and John gave thanks for the tobacco culture into which he was born. He spoke of learning to raise and prepare a crop for the market and the importance of hard work. He recalled that there were good markets and bad ones. The years when there was too much rain and not enough. Crops destroyed by hail or an early frost. He described tobacco men who gained stature and distinguished themselves based on how many sticks they could cut or strip in a day, or how neatly they could tie a hand, or what price per pound their crops sold for. The Burley Auction conventioneers and their spouse, spouses were from a shared culture and a common heritage. John was proud of this heritage. For half a century, the program had provided stable economies for rural communities and economic security for hardworking yeoman farmers. He argued that this was untrue of any other agricultural program. And as he did six months earlier, Barry criticized economists and politicians who would displace millions and discard an entire culture based on a new theory that the human element could not be considered in the larger global setting. The concerns facing little Johnny were more difficult than those that faced his father. Imported tobacco was challenging domestic tobacco. Burley growers in Kentucky and Tennessee continued to lease substantial amounts of their quota at prices at 45 cents a pound. Disgruntled quota holders in Kentucky and Tennessee sold their quotas for as much as $3 per pound. And in 1992, at its convention, the Kentucky Farm Bureau endorsed statewide quota leasing. In the months before Bill Clinton's election in 1992, and after hearing a buyer's industry analysis, Barry concluded that growers were being squeezed out of the industry by generic cigarettes, imported tobacco, and anti-smoking advocates. Before co-op board members, Barry asked if growers were at the mercy of tobacco companies and what were their alternatives. His recommendations were stop assisting tobacco companies writing regulations and reducing trade barriers. Explore the possibility of another antitrust lawsuit. Establish tobacco processors on a cooperative basis. Manufacture our own cigarettes design our own production control and support price system, or decide if Kentucky farmers could produce a higher priced, superior quality leaf. Instead, Kentucky growers and the co-op rode the program to its eventual decline in dissolution. Following Bill Clinton's election, Hillary Clinton spent much of 1993 devising a health care reform bill to be financed by sin taxes on tobacco. Some of these issues were deflected in Senator, Senator Wendell Ford's Domestic Tobacco Act that required American cigarettes to contain 75% of U.S. grown tobacco. In January of 1994, little Johnny underwent open heart surgery and resigned that summer as president of the co-op. That summer, John and his brother Wendell established an advisory board to the Modified Committed Commodity Growers Cooperative Association, gave it free office space in Lexington, and encouraged the transformation of the co-op into a food association. In his resignation speech, 
Little Johnny acknowledged his tenure was covered up by bad times for tobacco. And he apologized for his failure to unify farmers and diversify Kentucky's agriculture. He reminded his listeners that the co-op was born not of a desire to save tobacco, but to save farmers. Farmers who could not survive in the marketplace without each other. In the spring of 1998, President Clinton visited Carrollton, Kentucky as part of his campaign to discourage tobacco companies from marketing cigarettes to teenagers. He visited the Kentuckiana Tobacco Warehouse, hosted by its owner, Bethlehem Melvin Lyons, and his son, Brent. Blinton, Clinton convened a panel featuring the Reverend Wilbert Hale Goatley, the long-serving pastor of the First Baptist Church in Eminence. Two years later, the USDA established the President's Commission on Improving Economic Opportunity in Communities While Protecting Public Health. The commission was co-chaired by Rod Kegel, the new co-op president, and Matthew Myers, president of the National Center for Tobacco-Free Kids. The commission's report became the basis for the Tobacco Equity Reduction Program, or TERP, which brought an eventual decline to the program in 2004. The impact of TERP is another lecture unto itself. To this day, Kentucky farmers wrestle with the demise of the tobacco program. There are renewed efforts to identify the good of the program and to adapt it for 21st century farming. The Berry Center commemorates the work and the dedication of the Berry family and their dedication to the agrarian culture. That is its mission and life's work. It is my hope that this examination of history and public awareness of the tobacco program is useful to the Berry Center's work. At the outset of this speech, I noted that tobacco cultivation as a way of life has slowly ended. And so I will end where I began. I invite you to look closely at this last slide and think of its implications for Henry County and for all of Kentucky. Because no history of Kentucky would be complete without an understanding of the impact of tobacco on our state and our farms. Thank you.